in effect, what we see is that um, at the end of the last ice age, uh, we have a meltdown of the great ice sheets that was inexplicably fast, um, beyond anything that um, uh, allows itself of, a, of any kind of an explanation. Uh, it, actually, in the early 70s, with the advent of radiocarbon dating, uh, you know, which became a, a viable technology in the 1950s, it had become apparent to uh, glaciologists and climatologists and so on that the um, the melting of the ice, the disappearance of this huge volume of ice, which was actually greater than the, the mass of ice now covering the South Pole, was uh, so rapid that the energy sources required uh, apparently didn't exist. You know, in the older concepts, the, the ice, uh, it was imagined that the ice essentially disappeared uniformly and relatively smoothly over a period of about 40 or 50,000 years. Um, it, you know, and then that would be consistent with what scientists had seen at the end of the Little Ice Age, which, you know, terminated between about the mid-18th to mid-19th century, in which glaciers worldwide were seen to begin uh, regressing at a relatively uniform pace. Mm -hmm. By making those observations, uh, they extrapolated from that back to the Great Ice Age and assumed, well, at the rates we've seen, the glaciers receding, let's say between 1750 and, and 1900, we can extrapolate back and we can uh, imagine that these great ice sheets are receding at a, at a uh, similar rate and would therefore take, you know, so many tens of thousands of years to completely uh, dissipate. Well, with radiocarbon dating, that, that nice smooth model got thrown into disarray because it was realized that down to about fourteen or 15,000 years ago, the great ice sheets were there and fully intact and at their greatest mass. And then by eight to 10,000 years ago, they were gone. And so the problem became this, is that in order to convert this mass of ice into water, it requires thermal energy. So they started doing some calculations to um, try to determine just how much thermal energy. And the problem was is that there was nowhere on Earth where there was enough thermal energy available from terrestrial sources or, or normal um, solar sources to melt the ice that fast. Um, and they, they referred to this as the energy paradox. And um, there were several studies published between 1973 and 1975 where they were addressing this energy paradox and um, looking at the current climate of Canada, let's say, where most of the great uh, Laurentide and Cordilleran ice sheets were located, as, as they have been called, um, given the present climate, if you were to take um, an ice sheet, let's say the size of Antarctica, place it over Canada with the present environment, uh, it would take literally 30 to 40,000 years to melt the whole thing. Oh, wow. Because you figure that, um, it's only got three months out of the year that it's actually going to be melting, four months maybe. Mm -hmm. The rest of the year, you know, it's actually going to be recouping some of its mass through the form of snowfall. And then come spring, it'll start melting again. So they realize, well, it, you know, under the it couldn't have been a shift from a polar climate, which would have been necessary to sustain that ice mass to the present climate because obviously the ice would still be there. It would be diminished in size, but it would still be there. So then they looked at on the um, where on earth was the greatest uh, budget of thermal energy available, and that was over tropical oceans. And given, um, it, so now if you take the entire ice mass, <clears throat> displace it from Canada and put it flanking the equator, and it begins to melt, it's still going to take on the order of 20,000 years to melt the whole thing. So you can see where here, here's where the conundrum came in. And so they referred to this as the energy paradox. And eventually in 75, there was a conference held and they said, well, there must be an error in the data somewhere or there's something we're overlooking. So let's just put this on the shelf and, and get back to it later. And really, they've never gotten back to it. Wow. And it, you know, happened is even let's say if we allow between 14,000 and 8,000 years that's 6,000 years within that 6,000 years that the ice pretty much completely disappeared it was not a smooth process either it was a pulsed process within that there were apparently two great melting episodes in which 
uh, a significant percentage of the ice disappeared very rapidly. And then there was actually several hiatuses of melting between these, uh, what, what's referred to as meltwater pulse 1A and meltwater pulse 1B. And this has been, um, uh, um, it's been reflected in the studies of sea level rise because it was apparent that sea level didn't rise uniformly. Um, geologists, marine geologists have referred to these as CREs or catastrophic rise events. And apparently the catastrophic rise events would be associated with melting events of the ice because, you know, as the ice melts, it dumps its water back into the ocean basins and, and ocean levels rise. And so we're kind of faced with this situation that we've got these extraordinary events and there is not a ready explanation for these at hand. And, and uh, it, what I'm trying to do is part of my work is trying to get people to appreciate and realize uh, how extraordinary some of these changes were and that they were the level at which they occurred they, it's absolutely necessary to factor these into our thinking about um, our own story on this planet because another factor about this this timing is that um, it was in this interval right between meltwater pulse 1a and 1b that we have uh, an associated climate change we have a transition from what's known as the balling alarod which was a warming at the end of the last ice age, which began around 15,000 years ago, sort of what we would think of as a normal gradual warming. It began about 15,000 years ago and was progressing relatively smoothly till about 13,000 years ago. And then it was suddenly interrupted by this extreme warming event. And uh, then that extreme warming event was followed by a return to full glacial cold that lasted about 1400 years that's called the Younger Dryas. Then the Younger Dryas was terminated by another extreme warming event uh, that was is referred to as the Younger Dryas uh, preboreal transition. Um, and so you have these two extreme warming events. That, oh, let me recapitulate the scenario. Mm -hmm. The ice age seems to be undergoing a sort of the normal transition, the normal climate shift is beginning. The ice is diminished from its greatest extent, which was between 15 and 18,000 years ago. It's diminished to maybe 85 or 90 percent of its maximum mass. And then suddenly this nice orderly transition is interrupted by this sudden extreme warming event. We're talking about maybe 15 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit in, in less than five years. This would be undoubtedly associated and correlated with the first meltwater pulse. Okay, now, after that, the climate jerks back into full glacial cold, as cold as it was during the, the greatest depth of the Ice Age, let's say 18,000 years ago. This full glacial cold, called the Younger Dryas, after a polar wildflower, which had disappeared in northern Europe, suddenly makes a, a, a rapid return. Um, after this 1400 year cold snap there's a second extreme warming event and this is what essentially kicks the planet out of the grip of the ice age it's almost as if it was a, a you know two jerks that took required to get the planet out of the ice age <laughs> interestingly in that interval between uh, roughly 13,000 years ago and 1400 years later at 11,600 years uh, is when all the great megafauna disappeared um, and, and this is an extraordinary event that um, I don't think has been adequately explained. The dominant uh, explanation up to this point for the disappearance of the great uh, megafauna, the, the great mammals that uh, lived on the planet during the Ice Age was human hunting. Yet as more and more evidence begins to accrue, that, that explanation becomes less viable. Yeah. And we're, we're faced with, um, you know, the extinction, <clears throat> to put it in perspective, Roughly about 130 species of mega mammals disappeared globally at the uh, at the end of the Pleistocene, which was the end of the last ice age. Where when we talk about a mega mammal, the definition is is about 44 kilograms or about 100 pounds in body weight. If we count all of the numbers of species of mega mammals on the planet today, it's roughly equivalent to the number that disappeared uh, suddenly at the end of the last ice age. Um, and if we look at the, uh, the, the fauna of the last ice age, what we find it in America, for example, the only modern parallel for the density of great mammalian life would be the Serengeti Plain of Africa. Uh, I talked to, you know, 
Americans all the time who have absolutely no clue that a few thousand years ago there were three species of elephants living in America and there were camels and uh, ground sloths the size of, of modern day elephants and beavers that weighed 600 pounds and oh arms the size of you know Volkswagen Beetle cars and on and on and on <laughs> but those mammals uh, suddenly disappeared and they disappeared precisely within that window of extreme climate change and um so there's another event that to, to me ties in with that, that helps us to understand how extreme some of these events must have been because uh first of all when you think about large mammals um they're the ones large mammals require a, a greater range of habitat to survive they require obviously more food you know an elephant and presumably a woolly mammoth as well requires about you know at least 500 pounds of food per day so when you destroy habitat you know you you basically uh denied these animals their uh, their food source in addition of course their generational turnover time is much longer their gestation time in the womb is much longer uh, the uh, the time at which the young have to be nurtured is much longer and all of these things are going to be dependent upon a, a, a stable habitat or a stable environment and when we look at the extreme nature of some of the changes that occurred at the end of the last ice age uh, and the the, uh, the loss of habitat that would have uh, accompanied those changes um, I, I don't think I, I think it's really a diversion to try to uh, attribute the, the loss of the mega mammals to human hunting because the way I see it, humans would have been uh, as much a victim of these climate changes as, as the great animals were. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's a reason for this. If we, if we go to the root of the problem, if you will, it's, it's about energy then, as you say. Um, in your view, anything that can explain this? Can we go to uh, Charles Hapgood and look at the Earth crustal displacement? Can we talk about solar intense, I mean, immense solar activity? Or what do you think, uh, Randall? Well, now, bringing up Charles Hapgood is very interesting because when I was really getting started in my catastrophist studies in the 70s, he was one of my primary sources. And um, I considered the, this, the idea of pole shift as being a, um, uh, a viable explanation. You know, now his, his version of pole shift is not the entire planet uh, shifting. It's essentially the crust or the lithosphere becoming displaced over the mantle. Uh, as I learned more, I kind of begin to believe that that was not the explanation and yet several of the, the points that he brought up are, are very interesting and still don't seem to have any a, uh, adequate explanation for example if you look at the geographic configuration of the last great ice mass you see that it was centered over Hudson Bay and it was at its thickest over Hudson Bay and and Hudson Bay is is essentially the remnant of the depression where the Earth's crust was isostatically depressed under the weight of this great ice sheet. And you actually now, the studies of, of the growth of the glaciers, of the ice masses, show that it didn't, uh, in, like in the early conceptions, it was imagined that the ice grew southward from the polar regions. It did, it grew actually from a nucleus uh, adjacent to Hudson Bay, and it grew north as well as it grew southeast and west. So, um, and when we look at the extent of the ice and actually place, a, if we were to place a compass on the center of the ice mass at Hudson Bay and to draw a circle circumscribing the ice mass, what we actually see is that essentially it's very close to the circle that would be defined by the Arctic Circle. So, um, it, you know, it, it, it supports the idea that perhaps that, that Hudson Bay was actually at the polar region. Oh, and, he, and there is magnetic anomalies in the area to this day, isn't there? There's, this is believed to be the previous uh, magnetic pole over Hudson Bay, correct? Yes, and, and, it, yes. and, and it's interesting that, that, that the magnetic pole is migrating actually towards the geographic, what is now the geographic pole. Um, I think, my, my, what I, here's what I tend to think, is that the shifting of the Earth's crust a la Charles Hapgood, was not the cause of the event, but was a consequence of the event. 